William Butler Yates. Interesting individual. Um, I've been kind of helping you along the way and telling you, you know, if you get on Jeopardy and you forget names or you don't have any clue and you just have to throw one out, if you're in the 20th century, throw out his name. Okay, he will probably be an answer within that category at some point. Very famous. Um, reading in some about his bio info, um, kind of interesting early references and influences to William Blake. If you remember him back in the Romantic era, um, he was the one who did, uh, you know, his, uh, the etchings, okay, and put his, you know, poetry in etchings, um, but kind of was seeing angels and we were kind of thinking he might be a little, little crazy and so on. Um, but this individual isn't necessarily crazy, just, you know, influenced by that kind of writing and that kind of thinking and outside the box. Uh, interesting that, you know, the stubbornness of this individual, you know, the, you know, longing after this, this woman and so on. Uh, but things just didn't play out right. He calls it the, a miserable love affair because there just was, you know, it wasn't a great one. But he was just, it just made him miserable over and over again. Um, notice he is Irish romantic. Um, Irish in nature, very similar to Jonathan Swift. Um, so some of the things that, uh, you know, were relevant to Swift in the 1600s, um, you know, the, the, uh, um, uh, the struggles, uh, modest proposal we talked about, uh, the struggles of uh, religion and so on, that place uh, plays out continuously uh, even up through the modern time. Um, and we will see an example of, um, you know, uh, kind of the darkness about what is to come in the near future. Um, his shift, because in writing romantic and writing in the, the era of Blake and so on, um, excuse me, he didn't write in the era of Blake, but writes, writings uh, kind of mirrored that era. Um, and then they slowly transitioned to the modern. It said that he began to write in a less romantic style that more closely resembled natural speech. I think you'll see that in some of the stuff today. Um, his imagery became more economical and his tone more conversational. Um, less kind of like, what are you talking about? Oh, we have to really think. It's more about this is how we speak. Um, so it's easier to understand more um, by the typical uh, lay person and so on. Um, sailing to Byzantium. Sailing to Byzantium. Um, the main uh, I don't know, character, the narrator, is an old man. Okay, they use a line in here, there is no con or that is no country for old men. Hopefully that sounds familiar to a movie that some people may or may not have seen. No Country for Old Men was a Coen Brother movie. It won Best Picture Oscar a couple years ago. Javier Bardem was a serial killer and kind of had his hair chopped kind of bobbed and such. Um, really good movie, um, but that title is an allusion to probably this. Um, but he struggles. He tr struggles to find some acceptance. He struggles to find a purpose in a world that's just getting younger and younger. And where can he go? Well, I can go to Byzantium and so on. Um, and if you didn't read the building background, make sure you take some time to read that. Uh, so follow along, please. Sailing to Byzantium by William Butler Yeats. That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl commend all summer long whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing, for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence, and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, purn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal. It knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. 
Once out of nature I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling, to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. He refers to himself in that third line as a dying generation. Imagine the feeling, and we, when we talked about Ulysses just the other day, okay, remember how he was feeling just kind of, he's spinning his wheels, he can't get any traction, just spinning in the mud, he's just doing nothing, nothing, just kind of wasting away and all the adventures happening out there. Here is an individual who feels, you know, his generation is dying, he's dying. Not necessarily, well, I'm going to die in three days, but, you know, he, he, this world, this, this land is not for the old individual. It's for the younger people. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, compare, you know, this place isn't for old men. This country is not for old men. The young in one another's arms. You know, birds in the trees singing their songs. And, and the salmon falls, the macro crowd sees. So, so life is going on. Things are spawning. Th there's life renewed. But yet with him, there's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing to, to get excited about, and so on. Um, the second stanza, the second section, I love how it's, it's broken up the structure of this, because structure is kind of the main literary point um, of this particular section. Um, but an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. So, not much there just really just kind of keeping the coat from falling on the ground. He's just but, you know, a stick. There's really no point and no purpose. And that's why I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Okay? Because there's no place to, to do these things that I want to do or be appreciated for what I am or what I contribute in my place, in my home. And as you saw in the building background, the Byzantium is this cultural and artistic kind of mecca, the place to go and and find acceptance and, and be able to just, oh, you know, just, it's wonderful. And, um, and he struggles, you know, back home. And so he comes to Byzantium for that. And so the last, uh, the right-hand side um, talks about what he hopes to achieve in coming here. And so on, you know, calling out to the gods, the sages, those individuals that provide artistic inspiration. You know, please come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre, and be the singing masters. Come and inspire me. Be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away. And then look what he says about his heart, that it is sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal. So come and take my soul and take my heart away, inspire me, because this heart is attached to a dying, a dying animal, his, his body. But yet, take what I have to contribute. Please come and inspire me. You can take me from my, you know, my natural body and take me and put me in anything, whatever, and that's what we see in the last part, whatever the goldsmiths wish to make and put me in a, you know, a bird and I can sing and keep emperors awake at night and, and I can still be artistic and beautiful and appreciated and there's still something to live for. It's still positive here on the right-hand side. For the first left-hand side, it just really wasn't much um, it's just, you know, depressing. Oh, I'm not being appreciated. I can't do this. I can't grow and so on. But now we have an opportunity to really build it and be something. Even if it's not in the form you see now, come take my soul. Come take my heart away and put it in something that can contribute. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a, a positive uh, there. 